is Common Sense Radio. Straightforward and no excuses. This is the Steve Gruber Show. Call me crazy. What I said was perfectly right and spot on accurate. Boy's got a mouth like a cannon, always shooting it all. Stop, 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 stop. 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 I mean, you're way off script. Hey, boy. Yeah, you know, it's not cynical. It's common sense. Pay attention to me when I'm talking to you. I'm going to rock the nation. Genuine, accountable, and wrong. Here is Steve Gruber. All right, it's six minutes after the hour. The phone lines will remain open. 888-900-9966. 888-900-9966. Appreciate your support. You can find out more at stevegruber.com. You can listen live there at the Listen Live button. You can get all the podcasts from former interviews like the one we just did with Ben Carson. We will revisit that interview in the third hour here on the program. Podcasts, uh, a lot of great stuff from the Republican confab of on Mackinac Island this past weekend on there as well. It, 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 Katie Hyde was up there, Rob Burkhart, uh, two of the members of the team reporter, and... Uh, Producer, we're up there. So full length, full length speeches with Rand Paul, Ted Cruz, Rick Snyder, John Kasich. A tremendous amount of uh, great material there, plus interviews that Katie did sit downs. You can find that all at stevegruber.com. Just click the podcast button right there on the front page on the top right, bam. You can't miss it, and and away you go. Uh, Pope Francis wasted little time in in getting political in his um, trip to Washington. He dove into the whirlpool, or cesspool, if you will, of U.S. politics, using his first direct address to to the nation to weigh in on deeply divisive issues, most notably climate change. We used to call it global warming, but since that's been kind of dismissed, they call it climate change, which can pretty much account for anything. Cuba, traditional marriage, he was greeted by huge crowds packing the streets of Washington. He showed up in this little Fiat 500 sedan, uh, kind of cute, actually. And talking about his modest ways, I suppose. The panel flipped up to his reputation for blunt talk, introducing himself as the son of the kind of immigrant family on which America was built. You know, which doesn't change the fact. You know, he can sit there and 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 say what he needs to say, but the fact of the matter is this: America is a nation of laws, and if we ignore those laws, we're no nation at all. And I appreciate, you know, that you know, in the Holy See. That he can sit there and, 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 if you will, pontificate about all sorts of things. Uh, but it doesn't change the facts on the grounds. Speaking in English, uh, fairly poor, but, you know, you could reasonably understand him, I suppose. Uh, Francis, who was born in Argentina, said he was ready to listen to the hopes and dreams of the American people and offer guidance to those charged with shaping the nation's future in fidelity to its founding principles. Well, in, in our founding principles, it was about uh, self-reliance, accountability, uh, not relying on others, not income inequality, and demanding that your neighbors pay your way. That certainly wasn't America's founding principle. Uh, Wednesday began with a lot of pomp and politics, ended with a controversial canonization. The six-day visit will take him to the Congress today. Jonathan Carl of ABC News just posted online a really cool picture of a uh, his press pass to get in to see the Pope. Actually, I've seen a lot of press passes in my life. It was um, maybe one of the coolest press passes I've seen. But I will keep an eye on the Pope. I, 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 I honestly don't take it too seriously. You know, maybe for the 70 million Catholics in America, him saying that we need to worry about income inequality and, and let, you know, the southern border go, basically, and let uh, illegals come in. Fine. He can say that. I don't take that too seriously, nor... And do I think uh, the uh, the wide uh, wide majority of Americans take it too seriously? If I'm wrong, tell me so at triple eight nine hundred ninety nine sixty six. I have complete respect for the church and so forth. But when he when he strays into left field, both literally and figuratively, I kind of move on. I suppose I I just move on. Um, for Hillary, we'll have more. Like I said on the Ben Carson interview, that'll come up in an hour three. Here he was at Spring Armor College yesterday to a packed house. Uh, Ben Carson was packed house. More than 3,000 people packed into the event center there. Uh, An intelligence source close to the investigation of Hillary Clinton's server told Fox News that the FBI maintains the highest degree of confidence emails are being recovered 
adding, quote, that shadows and ghosts were on the server after messages were deleted. Shadows and ghosts remain even after a computer has been scrubbed. There are increasing levels of difficulty in retrieving information. However, this is according to the source, I am amazed at the level of our computer forensic people when they have the actual hardware. Bloomberg News first report that emails had been recovered, although the precise number not publicly known yet. But if you're in the Hillary Clinton camp, are you uh, are you nervous today? Are you nervous? All those emails that you were told were gone, Madam Secretary. All of those emails you told were gone, Madam Secretary. Well, some of them may be. Some of them aren't. Which is which? Mm. Mm -mm -mm. How are you going to spin this one? There's a bad moon rising. There is a bad moon rising, Mrs. Clinton. Something bad on the horizon. And then, of course, there's Joe Biden, too. The source adding that the FBI was also seeking to recover malicious code or any other evidence the server had been breached by a foreign government or foreign government-backed entity. Now, speaking to the Des Moines Register editorial board on Tuesday, Clinton publicly stated for the first time that her server had not been compromised by a foreign entity and that her private IT company assured her this was the case. Oh, boy. You know, when she goes on the record like that, if I'm on her staff, I just cringe. <laughs> Don't say that. And it's gone, and it's gone, and it's gone. There is no evidence of mine ever was, Clinton told the editorial board. Asked if the assessment was done by the State Department, Clinton said no. The technical people who ran it, who managed it, that was a private company in Denver. In the past, there were multiple reports of the server being offline or providing slow service. The intelligence source said, I would be greatly concerned that the repeated technical problem with the computer were results of someone, including the possibility of a foreign country, forcing unauthorized access to the server. From what I was told, this is sometimes a symptom of a system that has been compromised. Yeah. And so it is. Speaking of computers being compromised, German government ministers apparently turned a blind eye to Volkswagen installing cheat devices to fool U.S diesel emission tests, raising the possibility that the mushrooming scandal could cause embarrassment for Chancellor Angela Merkel. Britain's Daily Telegraph, citing a German parliamentary answer, reports that German ministers were warned months ago of the defeat device software installed on Volkswagen's diesel cars. The transport ministry answered a parliamentary question about the country's car industry on July 28, saying the federal government is award. Of de is aware, that is, of defeat devices which have the goal of test cycle detection, according to the Telegraph. The paper reported that while the government statement did not specifically mention Volkswagen, the question that precipitated it from a member of the country's Green Party implied that the car maker engaged in such practices. Hmm. The government told us in July that it knew about this software which has been used in the USA the so Green Party Deputy Leader Oliver Fisher, who would like us all to live in tents and ride camels to work. Uh, you think I'm making that up? 14 after the hour, it's Thursday, it's the Steve Hoover Show. Getting your day started with news from around the state and around the world. Common Sense Radio. This is the Steve Gruber Show. It's now 18 after the hour on this Thursday. It's the Steve Gruber Show. Great weather across the state for the next several days. So if you're going to get out and do something outside, now is the time to do it before, before things change. You've got a big window here, but it won't last forever, my friends. Speaking about windows of opportunity, that's what Vladimir Putin is taking advantage of as he moves more and more equipment and uh, um, creates a bigger Russian presence in Syria. Uh, might be building airstrips. An armed division, um, a mechanical division might be there. It's hard to say, but it, um, it, it is spreading. That's not hard to say. Peter Brooks, a senior fellow, for National Security Affairs uh, at the Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy at the Heritage foundation peter welcome to the program good morning uh you know vladimir putin is taking advantage of the vacuum 
left behind by the by the absent American foreign policy, at least in my estimation. Uh, what what do you believe? Well, I think that's true, uh, and there's a couple of other things I would add to that. Um, the Russians have a huge stake in what happens in Syria, and I'm actually kind of surprised they haven't gotten more involved up to this point. You know, they have a long-standing relationship with the regime in Damascus, uh, with the current regime under Bashar al-Assad, his father. They were long-time Cold War allies, and this has been Russia's window to power and influence in the Middle East. In fact, Steve, Russia, most people don't realize this, Russia actually has a naval base at, at Tartus, Syria. And they've had this for many, many years. They've had, uh, you know, a Black Sea fleet, and they've always been worried about NATO ally Turkey cutting off uh, the access to the Black Sea for its fleet uh, through the Dardanelles and the Bosporus Straits. So uh, Russia, and also the other thing most people don't think about, and I wrote about this last week in the Boston Herald, is that Russia, ISIS is actually has an affiliate in Russia. Um, Al-Qaeda has an affiliate in Russia in the southern region of Caucasus, and Chechnya, Dagestan, and I think there, and Russia's had a lot of problems over the years, especially in Chechnya, uh, with uh, violent Islamist extremism. So Russia has a lot of interest in, in being there. Uh, and one of the other things I think they're worried about is the fact that the, uh, the Syrian regime is teetering and there's not enough progress on the ground against the Islamic State. Well, then, then my question becomes, <clears throat> excuse me, um, okay, so the, the Russians are moving in and, and with, like you said, naval bases, airfields, equipment, advisors, uh, potentially actual boots on the ground, and then becomes this uh, relationship that they create with the nation of Iran because Iran's sanctions are now lifted. So money is flowing freely to Iran where uh, more equipment and military equipment and hardware is being sought. And then you end up with this uh, alliance between Syria and Russia and Iran, and the biggest player in the Middle East becomes Vladimir Putin. Oh yeah, no, there's no doubt about that. That's that's a, that's a potential that's a potential issue here. In fact, the Russians have proposed that we join up with them. You know, they, my understanding. You know, we're obviously a long way away from Syria and we're relying on news. But the Russians may have not begun military strikes. And what they've proposed to the White House is that uh, the Kremlin's proposed to the White House, hey, come along with us, ally with us. With the, the, the regime in Damascus, what the Obama administration has said has to go, and Iran and fight the Islamic State. Now, the reporting on this is a little unclear. There's others out there saying that maybe we can do parallel operations against the Islamic State. And, in fact, it looks like the president is going to meet with Putin in New York at the U.N. General Assembly when a lot of world leaders uh, meet there. And that previously wasn't scheduled. So, yeah, I mean, he's saying, come along with me in Iran and the, uh, the Bashar al-Assad regime, which is responsible for four years of civil war and the uh, 250,000 lives and uh, work with us. So the administration, because of their lack of progress on dealing with Iraq and Syria and the Islamic State, uh, is in a very difficult position. The situation has only gotten more complicated. Uh, it is, Mark. Now, what do you expect? I mean, we have seen the Russians, Vladimir Putin, uh, in, in recent uh, months and so forth, in my estimation, snub this president snub this administration, snub the United States, in effect. So what do you really expect out of this uh, potential conversation in New York? Is it going to be on the sidelines? Will it be a main event? What is this going to be, and what is it going to amount to? Well, I mean, the president's schedules are pretty hard to put together, so I imagine it's going to be on the sidelines. He'll find a time. I mean, remember, this administration, Steve, talked about the reset button, or resetting U.S.-Russia relations, and I don't have a problem with that, that effort, but it's really gone from reset to regret. Uh, the Russians, uh, especially under Putin, uh, who came back a, a few years into the Obama administration, he was president, then he became prime minister, and then he became president again so he wouldn't violate the Russian Constitution. Um, I don't think that the, the president and Putin have a, have a good relationship personally, and Russia really sees the United States as standing in the way of it uh, regaining its previous glory. Um, I mean, I think the uh, people like Putin uh, don't like how the Cold War turned out, and they see the United States as getting in the way of Russia returning to that level of power and influence globally. So I expect a side meeting at, in New York. I don't expect a lot out of it because I don't. Uh, the United States and Russia, our relations are very, very tense right now, 
And um, I don't think that the president and Putin have a have a good personal relationship. No, I, I don't think I don't think. Well, I don't think Vladimir Putin has any respect uh, for this president. I think it's part of the problem. I, and if you have no respect for the person you're allegedly negotiating with, well, that's not going to go well for us, now, is it? Well, we're going to have to. We'll have to see how it, how it goes. But I think the administration right now is not only scrambling about what to do about Russia because Russia has very capable military forces, and you want to make sure that our forces and their forces don't end up, you know, shooting at each other. You want to deconflict that. If you've got American aircraft in the air over Syria, and then you're going to have Russians. I mean, there could be real problems there, unintended consequences, you know, of this uh, of this situation. And I think that the, the, the administration right now, my understanding is that the special envoy for Iraq and Syria and the Islamic State uh, is going to step down. He's going to be replaced. Um, and uh, they're, they're talking about reviewing their policy in its entirety because of the lack of progress they've had. Uh, good conversation. Thank you for uh, revealing. Look, Peter Brooks from the Heritage Foundation. I greatly appreciate your time. Thanks a lot. Genuine Michigan common sense on display every day. It's 33 at the hour. The Steve Gerber Show here on a Thursday. We'll have we'll have more with that interview with Dr. Ben Carson coming up in hour three here on the program, and I look forward to sharing that with you. And, and your thoughts are also encouraged. You can call in at 888 9966 888-900-9966. Would like to get you involved with the conversation. Find out who you're supporting for president. Um, in the latest polls, it's it's more of the same. Donald Trump still in the lead, fading a little bit. Uh, Dr. Ben Carson, Carly Fiorina, the top three. The top three in the in the latest polling. And, and, and I saw maybe the most powerful bit of video I've seen in an awfully long time come from uh, Carly Fiorina on the Internet yesterday. It's a response ad put out by a super PAC on her behalf discussing her comments during the most recent presidential debate about a fetus on the table with its heart beating, feet kicking, and people discussing how to remove its brain for research. The left came out and attacked her. The media attacking her for lying. It just wasn't true. Well, it is true. And the video's out there, and it's in the most powerful uh, uh, campaign ad I've seen in an awfully long time. Uh, my next guest can weigh in on that as well. Deneen Borelli, chief political correspondent with Conservative Review and a Fox News contributor. Deneen, welcome back to the program. Hey, Steve. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Did you have a chance to see that uh, that clip? I, I have not, but I, I will say this, though. Uh, because Carly is uh, one of the top four candidates, she's much more prominent now. She did a, a really good job with the recent, last recent debate. Of course, uh, she will be the next target for people to be critical of. And this is, this is politics. It's dirty. It's muddy. And uh, this is to be expected. Uh, anyone who is the front runner, but especially anyone who will be in the top four uh, pick, which is uh, where Carly is right now, I think she's tied with Rubio at the moment. Yeah, she has definitely moved up, and her, uh, her stock has soared. Uh, since that debate, uh, most recently, and and if you do see the video, folks, uh, let me just tell you the, the the fetus is real. You better have a strong constitution. I don't know if any television network would air this spot, but the fact of the matter is that Carly knows uh, when she stepped out and said, you know, she wasn't going to make a mistake of that magnitude. Obviously, about there being a video or no video, the video is there, and it's it's it's. Um, I think it does speak to the character of this nation, Deneen. I think that what she has touched on for a lot of us, it is true. I mean, here we have um, yesterday, was it yesterday that, that, you know, Democrats will not support no abortions after 20 weeks. In fact, 177 uh, Democrats uh, voted against a law last week, I believe, that would have, that would have uh, required doctors to provide medical assistance if during an abortion a fetus is delivered alive, i.e. a baby is there. And 177 Americans, Democrats, said, no, we can't support that. I mean, my God, what day and age are we living in? No, you're absolutely right, and it's horrific. Uh, and a lot of those videos I, I can't even watch. Uh, but yeah, this, it, it, it's, 
it's barbaric uh, what we're witnessing, and uh, no comment, of course, with that uh, with the Pope in town and all the other focus was on climate change and uh, attack on capitalism, but no talk whatsoever about what's going on at Planned Parenthood. It's really outrageous, Steve. It is outrageous, and so I, I guess as you take uh, stock of this campaign for president, and Doreen and uh, Deneen, and you see what's going on out there. Um, uh, Donald Trump's starting to fade a little bit. Uh, ben Carson had a, a slight slip. Uh, Carly's rising. Marco Rubio's rising. Uh, what do you think? Uh, who who do you think is going to shake out uh, when this is all said and done? Well, that's just it. Uh, I view this as a marathon, Steve. Uh, it's it's going to be a while until we do get to the actual uh, election for president, but uh, there are so many candidates who are still running, and what the individuals need to do is separate themselves from this really crowded field. And uh, we're looking at outsiders who are in the lead versus um, actual politicians who are basically limping along, especially uh, those who are, 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 are sitting governors. Um, they're not doing as well. And when you talk to individuals on the ground, my husband Tom and I, we travel the country. We were just in Florida. We're going to be in your neck of the woods uh, next month. You talk to individuals. They are frustrated. They're angry. They are beyond uh, upset with our elected officials because they're not representing our needs. They're not listening to us. You have a lot of politicians who just want to be in office to stay in office, and they're not doing what they said they were going to do when they were running, when they were on the campaign trail. So people are frustrated, they're angry, they're concerned about the direction our country is going in, and that is why you have individuals who are not politicians who are in the lead because uh, Americans want representative leadership and people who will do as they say when they're running for uh, president. Well, there's a lot of talk of John Boehner being in trouble, and that Kevin McCarthy of California could be the next Speaker of the House. And, and you know, the, the anger is well-founded. I mean, let's be honest, I mean, in November of 2014, there were sweeping elections, big results. Uh, the Republicans swept into office with huge numbers, almost unprecedented numbers uh, in Congress. And yet, what has happened since? Nothing. Absolutely nothing has changed. Nothing has happened. The President gets to do and say and go and as he pleases. He can flaunt the Constitution, thumb his nose at Congress, and nothing changes. It, it, it's it, it, and the way McConnell, you know, bent over backwards to allow the Iran deal to go through, is to me, frankly, disgusting. No, you're right. And McConnell and Boehner, they're they're weak. They're weak leaders. That's and being generous. Obama, I think. Yeah, Obama continues to fundamentally transform our country, and you have individuals like McConnell and Boehner who were. Not, not listening to Americans, and they're doing and saying whatever they think is best, and they're just not challenging President Obama in any way, shape, or form. And again, this is feeding into the anger and frustration that we're witnessing from voters, from Americans, and why you have non-politicians who are in the lead in the polls right now. Yeah, it just seems they are doormats, the, this Congress. And so I guess my point being is, in a new poll that just came out, 62% of Republicans, I think this was a Fox poll, yeah, Fox poll here, 62% uh, of Republicans feel abandoned or, or, or you know, uh, abused. Betrayed. Betrayed, that's the word. Betrayed yes. by their own party. And I can't sure. blame them. I can't blame them either. Either I mean, it's, we're at the point where people are going to go to the phone book <laughs> to, to pick someone to run for office. And, and listen, it, it, it's, it's, been, it's taken a long time for our country to get into the situation that it's in with all of the spending and the debt. And me personally speaking, I, I wasn't someone who followed politics um, years ago. I wasn't someone who uh, did research and, and looked into what these politicians were saying and doing. I just voted, and I felt like that was it. That was my job. But... There are so many Americans now who are getting involved, Steve. They're uh, out in, uh, at night during the work week or out on the weekends um, meeting with individuals, going to these town hall events. They're challenging our, our elected officials, and they want answers. They want leadership. You even have people who are running for office who said they would never get involved in politics, and, and I'm meeting these individuals on a regular basis. 
They want to turn our country around, and it, people do have a role to play. Everyone has a role to play, and it's very important for folks to get involved and not just sit back and watch. This is not a spectator sport. It's not, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's time for something to change, and then that's where they are with it. Deneen, greatly appreciate your time. We look forward to seeing you here in Michigan in October. We'll talk very soon, my friend. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Michigan, born and raised with Midwestern values and Michigan common sense. I want to live. I want to give. I've been a minor for a heart of gold. All right, welcome back to it, 45 it's after the hour. It's Thursday. Appreciate your support. You can stop uh, by the website, stevegrewer.com. Uh, find out more. You can post your comments there in the in the comments section. You can find the podcast and you can listen live. It's all there for you. Plus, you can have a few um, a few other things to learn about what we do here. Uh, anything you want to know, there it is, stevegrewer.com. Over the last few months, a couple of years, it's become tougher, it would seem to me, from my observation, to become a police officer in this country. And why would you want to do it? I mean, you're accused of all sorts of wrongdoing by doing your job falsely accused and in in the focus of well of hate and murderous attacks police officers murdered uh because apparently they're police officers a tough place to be and a, a tough place to recruit that's for sure joining us on the program once again chief dan roberts former fbi agent he is also the police chief in franklin michigan uh, after leaving the fbi chief welcome back to the program hey it's good to be back with you steve i mean it has got to be hard my friend yeah, to tell yeah. people, hey, son, you can, you know, do the good thing. Be one of the good guys. Go into law enforcement. They look at you and go, what are you smoking? Yeah, there, there's no doubt. It's difficult right now. I think I've been doing this this stuff for a long time. I started back in the early 1980s, and I can recall as a as a young guy then trying to get on a police department, I'd go and, you know, be fighting with three or 400 excellent candidates for one or two positions that are open on a particular department. And now it's completely flip, flip-flopped. We're all fighting. All of us police chiefs are fighting for the same uh, shallow pool of candidates that are out there. Um, and, and frankly, a lot of the departments right now, the police departments, especially here in Michigan, are hiring officers right now because for several years they weren't. They were laying off or they were losing people by attrition but not filling those slots. But now we're in a period where uh, numerous police agencies across our state are are hiring, and there is very uh, shallow <laughs> pool of qualified applicants out there right now. Well, that's got to be tough, you know, because it's, because that phenomenon, uh, not only going on here in Michigan, but that same phenomenon is probably uh, recurring across the country, is it not? Oh, there's no doubt. I, I talk to, uh, you know, my counterparts across the country, and then we meet at various chief conferences across the country, and and, you know, with few exceptions, we, we are all in the same boat. We are all trying to uh, find the, uh, the good candidates that want to come into this profession. But it's been very difficult. As you mentioned, the negative press that's been brought on, on lately uh, to law enforcement has not helped at all. Um, that coupled with the economic factors of, uh, you know, when, it, when the economy was, was in a rough state from 2007 till a couple of years ago, uh, you know, cities and villages and townships were all cutting their benefits for police officers, including retirements and health care and things. And so it's far less attractive today from a financial perspective, uh, well, from many perspectives, uh, than it was years ago to get into this profession. So let me ask you, you know, you, you've done this uh, at the federal level, now at the local level, and, and you've had the opportunity over the course of your career to, to you know, circulate and mix with police officers from all levels right. uh, of law enforcement. And, and, you know, uh, what would you tell somebody? I mean, how, how difficult is it out there? I mean, how do you feel? Do these folks, do you feel targeted? Maybe in your little village, probably not so much. But, you know, if you're a state trooper or a county sheriff or, I mean, are you looking over your shoulder all the time? Well, you have to reinforce with training. And even in, in my little village, you still have to be aware of your surroundings. And we have to remind officers and, and hit the training hard these days when you look at all of these these recent incidents where officers have been ambushed and, and killed and like for example there was just i believe it was yesterday a deputy sheriff down in down in florida in okaloosa county uh... was shot and killed while he was just serving papers on someone for a, a legal issue uh... you just have to be 
completely up on your training, not get complacent, and that's what our supervisors get on to our officers. I know that goes in every police department where they're constantly harping on the training. But the flip side to that is, you know, in the perfect example I was thinking of this yesterday, I fielded a complaint from a citizen yesterday who was uh, stopped on a traffic stop by one of our officers, and she was incensed by the fact that while the officer was talking to her, uh, he had his hand on his firearm, which was in his holster, which is the tactical thing to do. I mean, because you have no idea when you pull somebody over who you're talking to. It could be the greatest person in the world, or it could be a mass murderer. You just have no idea who you're talking to when you pull somebody over on a traffic stop. So one of the techniques they teach, you know, is to not keep your gun exposed, but keep your hand close to it in case you need it. Yeah, well, it's this called woman being prepared. was absolutely incensed by the fact that this yeah. officer was doing that as he, as he spoke to her. Yeah, somebody who obviously doesn't appreciate law enforcement, so it is. We're on the line with Chief Dan Roberts, a former FBI man. Uh, he's a G-man. And uh, current police chief in the village of Franklin here in Michigan. All right, so I talked to a good friend of mine I've known for a long, long time who is in law enforcement and is in, in management of law enforcement. And, and and I asked him about these body cameras. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? He goes, you know what? It's like anything else. If you get part of it and the video is not clear on what happens, you know, it's still right. a matter of people looking at it and go, well, I see this. And I see that he's had, you know, three people look at the same video and they all get a different impression of what just happened. So he, you know, because the big push is for, you know, body cameras and so forth, and he remained, I say, less than convinced. Well, I think the train has left the station on that one. I think eventually you're going to see all the officers getting them. My biggest concern, frankly, is the privacy issues. So, for example, our officers frequently go into heated situations and domestic abuse or whatever it might be, and you're, you're going into someone's house. Uh, perhaps there's been a, you know, an argument between a husband and a wife. Perhaps they're in a state of undress. And, you know, it might be embarrassing for them if all of that is recorded, which it will be now with the officers, or even simple medical emergencies. You know, our officers respond to uh, medical emergencies at, a, uh, at an elderly person's home who have, you know, slipped and fallen in the bathroom or something. Do you really want, uh, you know, Grandma on video uh, out there for, for all to see? And what, uh, if, and what if Grandma has passed away and she's a decedent? Right. You know, right. I mean, I'm, I don't know. I, there, I see your point. There are so many privacy issues that have yet to be worked out with that, and uh, that's that's the part that's scary to me is, you know, who's going to make those decisions as to what can be edited and what can't. Well, and then the other question that, uh, and with this is for another day, but then okay, so you've got video going across the threshold into somebody's home videotaping. Is that now susceptible to freedom of information requests? And it so certainly forth? is. Chief, I greatly appreciate it. We got to run, but we'll talk about that one the next time you're here. Good talking to you, Steve. Chief Dan Roberts, everybody, here on the Steve Gruber Show.